Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion. I am Robert Kurtz, facilitator for the program. Today's webinar is brought to you by NVIEW Health, a provider of evidence-based behavioral health screening, assessment, and monitoring solutions. We're recording today's program, so all attendee lines are muted. Attendees will receive an email that provides a link to the recording of the program. Our panel discussion will begin with our moderator and panelists introducing themselves to you. They'll then answer your questions, including those submitted in advance of the program. You can submit any questions you have throughout the discussion via the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We have a large audience with us today, so our panelists will not get to all of your questions, but they will work to follow up on those questions they do not have the opportunity to address. I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Tom Young of Enview to lead us into today's program. Dr. Young? Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I'm really happy to be the moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, rather than speak about myself, I want to begin by having Dr. Bargava uh, introduce herself. Hansa, can you? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here uh, today to talk about such an important topic. Uh, I'm, I'm um, Hansa Bargava. I'm a board certified pediatrician, chief medical officer of Medscape, uh, senior medical director at WebMD. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, uh, compassion trained at Emory University and uh, staff at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Thank you. Uh, Josh, uh, tell us about yourself. Good afternoon, guys. I'm Dr. Josh Spitanik. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm board certified in behavioral and cognitive psychology. I'm the CEO and owner of Anxiety Specialists of Atlanta, a large anxiety and OCD center uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta. I'm also adjunct assistant professor at Emory University in psychiatry, and I spend most of my time educating and treating psychological issues, specifically in the anxiety and OCD space, and training people on evidence-based interventions in psychotherapy. Thanks you, Dr. Spitalman. Sherry, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to NDU for sponsoring this. I'm Sherry Ferugia. Uh, I'm the CEO for the Global Center for Medical Innovation. Uh, my background, I spent years in pediatrics, and that's really when I became uh, very passionate about uh, some of the, the mental health crisis in our country. So today, I am not a physician. I am not a uh, psychologist. I am not a psychiatrist. I am here as a lay person to share my experiences. Thank you, Sherry, and we'll look forward to that. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into the first question, and I'm going to put it out to all the panelists and uh, ask uh, Hansa if you would be the first one. So the first question for today for the panelists is, what have you personally experienced with the pandemic's impact on your patients and your coworkers? Yeah, and that's such an important question. Unfortunately, what we are all experiencing right now um, in pediatrics and as, as well as my colleagues is just a tremendous surge um, of mental health illness. And that is happening across the board uh, with increases in uh, presentations of mental health related issues in the emergency rooms, uh, in, our in our primary care offices. And in addition to that, I would also add, add that unfortunately, the healthcare workers are also experiencing the surge of mental health illness as well. So it's, um, it's an unfortunate time. And that's why I do agree with experts who call it the second pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Bargava. Uh, Dr. Spitalman, what are your thoughts about that? Seeing very similar things as Hansa is, um, as a director of an outpatient clinic, um, we are seeing a significant number of patients we've seen in the past coming back for treatment, a significant number of people who have never sought treatment before coming in for treatment, and we're seeing people more in acute crises seeking out treatment. I think given that mental health providers and other providers as well are more available through teleplatforms like this, if they're HIPAA secure, um, we are more available to the general public, which is good in certain ways, and it's challenging in others because now we can be accessed almost anytime, anywhere. And so, Tom, I, I, I'm, it's wonderful to see how many people are reaching out to get their needs met. I like to talk about that we all know that we have medical health, and finally, people are admitting that we all have mental health, good, bad, or indifferent, we all have it. But as Hanta mentioned, the surge is overwhelming. Um, being in touch with clinicians around the country who run practices like ours, wait lists are growing, clinicians are hard to um, get their support, um, get them sort of um, cared for. 
And so we're seeing a trickle effect of clinics doing their best to support the need in ways that they've never experienced really before. Thank you. That's a great point, Josh. Sherry, your thoughts on that question? Yeah, so for me, what became, uh, I mean, honestly, a, a real shock to me is I had just personally had four friends reach out to me and ask for help uh, because of my relationship with in pediatrics to say, how can I get my child help? And, and, you know, Josh, you were mentioning how people who had never sought treatment before and had sought help before that you were seeing them for the first time. And in every single one of these instances, it was um, all children, all pediatrics who had not exhibited, at least from their parents' perspective, uh, you know, any, uh, any clues to, to mental health issues until, as, as Hansa referred to it as the second pandemic. Uh, from a coworker's perspective, you know, we have been, you know, up to our neck in delivering PPE, and it has been very eye-opening to see the stress that our clinicians are under, uh, where they literally are not leaving the hospital for days at a time. They're exhausted. They're, they are showing signs of depression. I've, I've never really seen this so rampant before in our clinician. And, and then, uh, you know, as someone who is uh, a Georgia Tech employee, you know, we're seeing it with faculty and we're also seeing it with students. So it just seems to be that in today's world, in this second pandemic, that we're all susceptible to, um, to, to, to the mental health crisis that, that we're seeing. No one is exempt. Yeah, all, all of us are involved. Uh, kind of following up on that question, a little more specific, and I want to go to Hansa and, and get her thoughts about this. Specifically, uh, I think for both Hansa and, and, and Josh, specifically, what are we seeing different in children and adolescents than, say, pre-pandemic uh, that we are? Wh where are the differences? What are your thoughts on the different things that we're seeing now? I think that we are seeing, uh, you know, the elevated numbers, of course, as we referred to before. I think the differences are that we have been through a year and a half of radical changes and social isolation. And unfortunately, uh, we've had to pivot so many times and, of course, appropriately so with public health measures. But unfortunately, with the social isolation in the background, which, you know, we all know um, socialization is a buffer. Uh, against, or I, I should say in the prevention of mental health issues, as well as just normal, uh, not normal, but, you know, sadness or um, uh, our feelings of depression. Uh, that was where we started. And then the, what we led to is actually now, uh, again, constant pivoting, because now we're seeing uh, third and fourth and fifth waves uh, hitting us. And so again, pivoting again, in that constant a uh, sea of change with the background and the drumbeat of, you know, social isolation and the bad media news has been really difficult for people. So as Sherry and Josh said, I think the differences are that we have this background, but also that uh, more people are being affected. Josh, your thoughts on that? It's impossible for me to think about, so my clinic and clinics like ours, we treat kids, teens and adults. We see all ages as young as three. It's impossible for me to think about the kid without thinking about the system that he or she's operating in. And Hansen nailed it. Socialization is a buffer. In the organizational systems and the extracurricular activities we have our kids in, those are all buffers. They're all mitigating institutions that help our kids have other touch points and have other people have eyes on them and giving them opportunities to learn social skills and emotional regulation skills. And really for the last 18 months, we've asked parents, single parents, um, blended families, parents where both families are working in the home or out of the home. We've asked parents to become therapists, medical providers, um, teachers, educators, counselors, speech language pathologists, uh, physical trainers. We've asked parents who are the, you know, the core of the family to do the lion's share of all of the work. And you know, my heart goes out to teachers, anyone who'd underappreciate their teachers prior to the pandemic. Well, you know, joke's on you because teachers have been the backbone of this, this country supporting our children no matter what their needs are. So Tom, children's needs are, are serious right now. And the lack of socialization for certain kids and the lack of opportunities to go out because they're wearing masks or because people are, are afraid of you know, uh, pandemic spread is significant. But what's happening in the home, whether you're homeschooled or not, 
virtual school or not, the stress in the home, the stress on the parents, the stress on the families, it's trickling down to the kids and, and they're all feeling it. Um, and so that's just my, my initial response to your question is to think about how kids are struggling is really speak about how the family unit is struggling. And we need more services to support parents, grandparents, uh, caregivers. Um, and that's to me almost the third wave of all this is getting families on board with getting their needs met as a unit, not just the individual kid or, or teen or adult. That's a great response, Josh. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. I think one of the things I've always said is that children are explorers into the wonderful world of psychotherapy for their families. And I think particularly so in this particular instance, we're seeing that. So following on to the next question, and Josh, I'd like for you to tackle this one first. Why is addressing mental health such a challenge for healthcare professionals specifically? Well, besides the stigma, um, which has been around forever, we still use, unfortunately, pejorative terms like OCD, which I'm a specialist in treating, and other terms as adjectives. We don't say that someone is so diabetes or so diabetic or they're being so cancer but we still say someone's being so crazy, someone's being so schizophrenic, someone's being so OCD. And so somewhere in the last 50 years, we all agreed that these psychiatric labels or terms have become descriptors of people. And we haven't shed that yet. And I'd be interested to hear what Hans has to say about this, but we still look at people who have mental health struggles, emotional problems, behavioral issues, people who are autistic, people who have neurodevelopmental issues, as it's their fault. And that hasn't changed much, despite a lot of you know, uh, compassion work out there and a lot of good work supporting advocacy for various populations. Unfortunately, in my clinic and clinics around the country, we still see people talking about mental health like it's your fault, you've caused it, you're not doing enough about it. Um, and I think a lot of us do view alcoholism and disorders like that as a much more medicalized kind of concept, I'd hope, but we still view things like depression and anxiety, the two of the most diagnosed disorders in the country, anxiety disorders in general, which cover eight specific disorders are the largest class of psychiatric problems in the country. And still we blame people for having panic attacks, for avoiding social events. So Tom, I think the biggest challenge of mental health providers in general is just helping people open up the dialogue like these events are, talk about mental health, just like medical health, talk about it as Sherry alluded to, which is we all have it, we all experience it, no one's immune to it. And if we start there, I think a lot of the reticence to get people in, uh, concerns that providers have to even use a diagnostic label, which some of us have to do for billing purposes. If we can get over that hurdle, I think talking about this on a national platform would, would really you know, fix a lot of the issues we have here. I'd love to see someone next to Fauci you know, talking about the medical side of the pandemic as having the mental health equal person next to them saying, let's talk about people's emotional needs on a national level. I'd love to see that person next to our medical providers out there um, so that's, that's my thoughts on that. Amsa, your thoughts. Yeah, I just want to um, dovetail into something that Josh said, first of all, um, uh, in the question prior, I completely agree with him that the families have taken a huge burden on with the children being affected. Let's not forget about that. And let's not forget about the parental anxiety and depression that exists and how much they have had to take with the online schools and how many kids, how many uh, I'm just going to refer to equity here because we, you know, uh, I I have spoken to uh, some pediatricians, the AAP school committees, for example, who have pointed out that in some communities, 90% of kids were not learning um, at that, you know, um, during that time of online school, and also point out that there was increased substance abuse, there was increased um, unfortunately, domestic violence, child abuse. So there's a lot of ramifications that have um, kind of uh, like t um, arms from the mental health crisis, I would say. Um, so in terms of uh, this issue, of course, I would just say that, you know, we just need to continue to increase the awareness. I think, Josh, I don't know if you agree with this, but I do feel like one of the silver linings of COVID and the pandemic is that I think that we are talking about this more, and you know, um, I'm I'm very hopeful that this will this conversation will continue, so we can actually address access and all the issues that come along with this crisis. Thank you, and that that leads into another question I have, and I'm going to ask Sherry to to ring in on this for just a minute. What are the specific challenges that that you per, you perceive and that face underserved communities as a result of this pandemic? I think there's a sort of the fractionation 
uh, of, of the different communities and the underserved communities particularly may may have responded differently and to some extent uh, had, had more problems. Sherry, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, Tom, I'll give you a classic example. Right now, my you know internet is a little unstable. And it's probably because I have literally 38 connected devices in my home. Um, and but guess what? In the underserved community, they don't. And you know, so not only did they not have internet, not only did they not have you know 10 computers or iPads that they could connect to, but both parents, uh, assuming there were two parents, were working outside the home. Um, you know, I had friends who set up a classroom in their house. The underserved community wasn't doing that. Uh, you know, how were they going to eat? There was one meal a day that they got, and that was the one at school. What about the child who was uh, in an abusive situation? The teacher no longer had eyes on that child. Um, it, it goes on and on. I mean, the stories that I hear of, of teenagers who were at home during the pandemic and you know, there were zero, zero, zeros. And when the teachers would approach them, they'd say, I'm home now, I'm having to go to work with my dad. He, you know, he owns his own business. And you know, if I'm home, I'm working. Um, it, it has put, kids had to grow up in the underserved community so quickly during this pandemic. They went from maybe being a 14 year old to a full blown adult taking care of either their younger children, trying to find food for the family, going to work and working, you know, 10, 12 hours, then trying to do their schoolwork. The inequities became not only apparent, but blaring during, during the pandemic. And I think that as we move forward, it's important that we learn from this and that we do not leave any child behind, whether it's in pandemic one, pandemic two, or just our day-to-day -day lives. Great points. Hansa, your, your thoughts as a pediatrician, particularly uh, focused on how children from underserved communities, you know, uh, whether it's inner city, whether it's rural, uh, what, how, do you, how do you perceive that? I would echo Sherry's comments. I think the inequities are exponential. They, the, this, this pandemic, the mental health pandemic has, you know, and the pandemic itself has uh, absolutely made it um, giant. And I, I, I would point to what Sherry said as well. We forget that one in four kids are actually food insecure in this nation. And that was before the pandemic. So um, the food insecurity, as, as Sherry said, the lunches they rely on um, being, you know, the digital divide, uh, which means that they don't have the internet. And even if you give them a laptop from school, they may not have the internet uh, to use it at home. So how are they supposed to be online school? And, uh, you know, the other issues uh, of, you know, increased strain. I mean, there was hundreds of thousands of women who left the workforce last December. Uh, that those were a lot of those were moms because somebody had to oversee the education. Somebody had to oversee what was happening at home and what, you know, what kind of strain did that put on the entire family, uh, whether it's a single parent blended or on um, two person family. So I think the children have suffered. If I could yell from the rooftops about the children, the children aren't all right. They're not. The kids are not all right. And they have been, I feel, as a pediatrician and a mom and a parent that Honestly, they have paid the price for you know all of what has happened, and that's what makes me really sad. I think we'd all agree with that, uh, Josh. I want to I want to pivot to another question, uh, sort of on back on the other side, on the provider side, and ask you to uh, maybe give us some insight uh, on some of the unique issues that our mental health professionals are facing uh, during during this pandemic. Again, we've heard a lot about in the news, medical professionals, and clearly that has been an incredibly stressful thing. But how about our, our behavioral health professionals? Well, if you bring the underserved population together with the populations that are sort of distanced or further away from central locations, I think one of the things that clinicians are starting to see more of are people that traditionally would not be able to come into therapy for purely geographic reasons. I'm not a huge fan of teletherapy. I've been doing it well before the pandemic. 
I use technology quite a bit in our clinical practice here. Um, but most of us in the last 18 months have had to immediately adopt to use some sort of teleplatform. Dermatologists and pediatricians have been doing this for years prior to the pandemic, probably the two leading medical industries. But therapists traditionally don't do therapy over Zoom. That's not what we do. So, Tom, I think one of the biggest changes or impacts I've seen with clinicians is their readiness to support people from anywhere around their region. Here in Atlanta, Georgia, most clinicians can only operate within the, the boundaries of the state of Georgia. Uh, myself and a few other clinicians in the state of Georgia who are psychologists are members of something called SIPACT, which is a, a regulated uh, ability, an interstate regular bill, regulated ability for me to see people currently now in 26 different states. So many clinicians are being asked to see people in rural communities remotely, seeing families that are coming and going between schedules remotely, asking to see the kid without the parent, because as Hans and others talked about, mom's at work or mom's trying to shuffle something, the kid still needs to be on video. So therapists are being asked to provide remote services to individuals who are either technology limited or are being asked to do things that they normally haven't had to do in therapy. We're being asked to see people that we want to see, but that the wait list is so long, we're now more accessible. The, the irony of us being in, in a phase of doing teletherapy is that anyone can kind of reach us at any time. And there's been a boom in the United States in the last pretty much six months to a year of online teleplatforms and therapy companies, uh, I think all with the best intentions, but to me, it's diluting the quality of care. So you have clinicians who've been doing brick and mortar therapy for a long time, competing with clinicians and companies around the country who are just trying to serve the need and they're kind of coming together and clashing. And my fear is that we're seeing a degradation of the quality of evidence-based care. No one goes to see Dr. Bhag Bhag Dr. Bhag Bhargava, no one goes to see a physician, no one goes to see a, a psychiatrist, a cardiologist and ever questions evidence-based care. But in the therapy world, evidence-based care is a division. Some of us claim to be doing what I think is evidence-based or empirical medicine through therapy, and some people are doing other kinds of therapy. So from the numbers that we're seeing in the wait lists, seeing people from locations we've never interacted with before and asking clinicians to basically get outside their technological or brick and mortar comfort zone and do services and protocols that they're not accustomed to, we're asking clinicians to really stretch themselves. And I'm just hoping that people are getting quality training and quality credentialing to provide still evidence-based first-class psychotherapy. Well, I think you and I've had this discussion before. There's a difference between accessibility and availability. Sure. And, and currently, the, I think one of the things the pandemic has done uh, and we appreciate all of your thoughts about this is uh, it, it, while it's created accessibility that we didn't have before based upon rules, we just don't have enough of everybody. Mm. Uh, even, even in the school system, Tom, the, the, the last statistic I saw is for every, I think there's one school psychologist for every 1,200 kids in a school. I think it came out by the American Academy of Pediatrics recently. That's obscene. There, there are not enough therapists in the country. And to Dr. Barb Gava's credit and other pediatricians, they're the front line of psychiatry. Everyone knows that primary care doctors, not psychiatrists, are the leading prescribers of medication. Thank God someone is, but the mental health system is tapped. And I'm hopeful discussions like this, as Hansa alluded to, and really getting the platforms out there where therapy and other services are more available across state lines are ways to really help clinicians serve the need, but doing so with still thoughtful, compassionate, evidence-based care. And, and I know uh, one, of, one of the things that NV is focused on is you know, providing those tools out into the world. Hansa, your, your follow-up thoughts on that in terms of uh, the providers? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that the providers, as Josh alluded to, we knew that there was, a, there was an issue with access and the number of providers in each state. We knew before the pandemic that 50% of the states had less than 50% of the needs covered. And now, of course, the needs have doubled, tripled, quadrupled. So we are in a tough position. And I have heard some, from some of my colleagues, uh, and Josh, I'd love your thoughts on this, but even the mental health care providers are feeling really overburdened, mm -hmm. um, stressed, burnt out. I mean, day at, you know, to, to, to hear uh, the stories and to talk to people day after day and to work extra hours, uh, they also, you know, they're, they're also humans. And just like the healthcare providers are burned out from the COVID pandemic, 
uh, my sense is that they are also burned out from the mental health of the pandemic. Am I right, Josh? Absolutely. So in the beginning of the pandemic, the, I would call it the first phase, many of us were honored to provide support to frontline workers, healthcare workers, police, firefighter, almost off the record for free, pro bono, just to do it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of us have had to pull back from even that level of, of support to the medical community who's done an amazing job because we're strapped, we're, we're thin, we're trying to do our best. So I, I think anyone out there in the therapy world who's doing what I do needs to make sure that you know self-care is a priority for the work that you're doing in your own clinic. I try and do our best here to make sure that we're all tending to our needs here. But Hansa, I think therapists around the country are being asked to do the amount of work, the level of work, the frequency of care that it's, it's um, you, you really can't keep up. And um, there are wait lists in most clinics, whether you're taking insurance or fee for service, clinics are talking about wait lists. There are hospital systems in mental health, not in, not in medical health. We all heard all the horrible news stories in, in medical health, in mental health, quality hospital systems that are, that are nationally recognized as the top of the top who've closed their doors because there's not enough beds. There's not enough nurses and practitioners to provide the services there. So from the top down, from the medical side of inpatient and residential treatment to community mental health clinics, um, clinicians are doing their best job. And we don't want clinicians burning out if they're trying to support people who themselves are emotionally stressed as well. So how do we support, and I'll focus this question to anyone who wants to jump on it first. How, how, do, how do we, provide for help? How do we believe healthcare providers can more effectively meet these challenges? I mean, they're here. They're, they become front and center. Uh, they were there before, just we weren't paying attention. Now they're really here and we're really seeing them. We're really paying attention. So what? how do we meet this growing and critical need for better mental health care? What are, what are some thoughts around that? Um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Uh, first, if that's okay. I, I think, and I'd love to hear Sherry's thoughts on this as well, but I do think that one, again, one silver lining of all of this is that perhaps just like telemedicine was more access and uh, became much more prevalent, there were so the restrictions were changed around it. I feel like digital innovation has really stepped up as well over the last year. And I personally uh, am very excited. I mean, the amount of innovation that's happening in mental health can really close those gaps. And, and you know, I think it's necessary for us to, uh, as physicians, uh, as healthcare providers, to take a look at that um, and, and see where and how we can use those to bridge the gaps we have. Yeah, Great so, point, Sherry. Sure. Yeah, so Hansa, to kind of follow up on that, you know, as you know, some of the statistics that, you know, that I see out there is that it takes, and Josh, you can please step in if I'm, if I'm, if I'm quoting an inaccurate statistic, but that it takes uh, 10 years to get an accurate mental health diagnosis. And that part of the reason that is because it is the primary care physician who is uh, making that diagnosis and prescribing those medications, doing the very best that they can, by the way, as, as someone can speak personally about that. I do believe that digital um, health, uh, that technology can really assist in this. Uh, I am a, uh, an advocate of every, speaking for pediatrics for a moment, every child should be screened. Uh, when I take my kids to the pediatrician, they ask me things like, are there guns in the house? I mean, there's a whole list of questions, right? No one ever asked me about my mental health, what I think about the mental health of my child. No one ever you know, asked my child. There's, there's no screening that goes on. Um, so I think that if we can assist, if, if, if technology like InView can assist in, um, in, in providing a more accurate diagnosis quicker, then the hope would be that primary care physicians and um, psychologists and psychiatrists can then work together to come up with a more accurate diagnosis. And then eventually, you know, the, the, the goal would be that we could inter intervene much earlier with, you know, with that child. So I'm a big believer. It's the reason I love InView. It's the, it's the reason I've spent my life in technology is I think that in really every aspect, every vertical of healthcare that it can, that it can assist the providers. Well, Josh, I know you're very uh, technology savvy, very focused on the technologies of healthcare. What are you, what are, well, let's just dive into that for just a minute as, a, as another question. So what can technology do? What should technology be doing? So this, 
if you go back one step with me, Tom, um, again, thinking about Hansa's world, everything a physician does is based on science and data and metrics in preconceived medical directories and FDA regulations. And I, I love that. The psychology, counseling, therapy, family therapy, social work world is just not developed that way. Um, so if we start there and we start training therapists, and I use that word just as, a, as an umbrella category, therapists to be more clear about how we accurately assess diagnoses, how we accurately assess and then diagnose problem areas, as Sherry alluded to. Sometimes it can take 10, 12, 14 years um, to even get an accurate diagnosis, which is disturbing. But if you start with metrics, which most primary care doctors and medical providers do, metrics that demonstrate here's the data that supports a diagnosis of heart disease, cancer markers. There's enough data out there that we all know, at least in the space of depression and all the anxiety categories of what we would easily classify as a specific depressive episode. Someone who's actively suicidal, someone who's battling substance abuse versus dependence. There are clear instruments out there that the field knows about that have been proven and demonstrated that are good ways to assess and diagnose problem area. Tom, I'd be shocked if even one fifth of my field uses those. And I'm talking paper and pencil. Move that to digital. I would love to see a, a requirement that therapists, clinicians, psychology level, licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical so social workers, those kind of therapists are almost being required to offer evidence-based assessment at the beginning that leads to evidence-based diagnosis in the middle that leads to evidence-based interventions. It is mind boggling to me. Um, and I know I sound elitist and, I, and, and I've been on that soapbox, but it's mind boggling to me that in my field, there's a wide range of what therapy even is. Um, and no one debates knee surgeries and cancer treatments. We might have various cancer surgeries, but they've all been regulated and proven or they're experimental and people know about those sciences. So I think Tom, technology can start with having digital systems that accurately assess problem areas, which in view is one of the leading companies in the country developing those applications that lead to an accurate diagnosis and then getting people trained on actual interventions that get people better quicker. Most therapy services, if done properly, don't take three to five years. They can be done in three to six months if efficiently. For some problem areas, three to six sessions. But when you're not assessing and diagnosing properly, Tom, you're starting blind. And so there's enough low budget technology out there from electronic medical record systems, mobile apps and digital platforms for surveys, just to bring together all of the most proven assessment tools that lead to accurate diagnoses. And then hopefully, you know, clinicians get trained on doing the, the leading, you know, gold standard of whatever the intervention is for that problem area. But that's just the beginning of it all. We can get in a deeper technology discussion. I don't want to derail that. But Hans's field would never go into a, a medical assessment with someone without real data and science determining what a diagnosis is. And our field still plays Russian roulette with that. And that's just, it's just fascinating to me. Well, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think one of the things that's that maybe driving that, and, and again, it's open for comment, but the whole concept of measurement-based care, uh, well, that's uh, something that everybody starts to talk about, and we've talked about it, I think, in, in the medical world uh, substantially in terms of measuring blood pressures, blood sugars, tracking all of that data over time. Um, but we haven't maybe done it like you're saying, Josh, in the behavioral health field. So, so the role that technology can play, um, what are the key considerations for, for technology uh, that providers should look for? You know, we're looking at providers as they research their technology options. As you point out, Josh, there's, there's a ton of them out there. What are the, what are the keys, Hans, as you look at it, Sherry, what are the key technologies that we need to help our providers of all field, medical therapy or otherwise? What, what should they be looking for? What are the things that are, that are key elements for them? I, I'll just jump in and say, you know, I do think that, and I think Josh said this, but the American Academy of Pediatrics just released a policy recently asking all of the pediatricians, no matter what the complaint is, to do a screener for mental health. And, you know, I think that's really important. But here's, here's the 
part that wasn't spoken about that I think needs to be also addressed. And that is the fact that the physicians are overburdened. They're burnt out. They need to have a really quick and efficient way um, that is evidence-based to be able to diagnose and, you know, um, put a patient on a treatment plan. And yes, you know, mental health, I personally believe, and I, you know, I'd love to hear Josh and Sherry's thoughts on this, probably should be a fifth vital sign uh, because, you know, we know the links between physical health and mental health. And, you know, if that stroke patient is not mentally well, chances are they're not going to be as compliant. And of course, we know that biologically stress can have impact on arteries and all can create havoc all over the body. So I do think that that fifth vital sign exists, but until then, I think we need to have screeners that are efficient and I think digitally based. And, you know, also keep in mind that it's, they cannot be one extra thing for the primary care physicians to do. So it, I, I think from that perspective, I'll leave, and I know there's FDA regs and clinical trials, so I'll, I'll let the others speak about that, but I will just say the primary care provider, that's, that's really important. So the only thing I would mention and to add on to that, Hamza, is that is that every, yes, absolutely. So that this is literally integrated into the workflow for the primary care provider so that we're not overloading them. It's not one more thing, but there's little and, and the only thing that's going to do that is going to be technology. Yes, te technology has the ability to do, Hansa, what you described, which is to have a quick screener screener that people have. You know, that scientists have approved as, you know, for depression, for anxiety, for problem area. And then the next level is using that technology to then make almost a repository of potential referral options. But if you put all the burden on primary care, um, it, it's not going to be sustainable. So I have no doubt that the front lines of mental health really starts in the medical office. It does. And sometimes in the ER. But then when it gets referred out or triaged out, primary care is not in, in, the, in the, the ability to then deal with what happens next. So there's got to be an interaction between primary care and the behavioral medical, you know, um, health division. Integrated models are, I think, some of the best. Are the, they're hard probably to sustain from business and, and, and policy standpoint, Hansa. But um, I have a few colleagues who, do, who are mental health people that work in primary care, setting, care settings. They love their job. There's a real interaction between medical doing screening, mental health doing that then legwork if needs to be done. And then if it needs to go to a higher level of care, the mental health provider knows how to refer out. That's a beautiful interaction between personnel and the use of technology really making decisions, but it still starts with evidence-based measurement, figuring out what's wrong, who do we go to? Um, and that's you know from assessment to triage to treatment planning. So, and these are very light technologies, Tom, and we're not talking about sophisticated artificially intelligent things. These are tablets, these are surveys, these are things that we've all used um, and they're just not being used on a national level. Well, I mean, gosh, we're already doing that. If you think about, I mean, in, in regular, in, in traditional healthcare, right? We have transition of care, we have continuum yep. of care, we have primary care physicians making a referral over to the surgeon. They're not doing the surgery, nope. right? Um, and and so those models have been proven. So if we could take those models and apply them to mental health, you know, hopefully we would see a more integrated um, system. That'd be amazing. I think what you all three are talking about really is just that: it's system change. Because I know one of the things I always get from physicians is, okay, so now I know what, what's wrong. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I fix it? So I think what, we're, what you guys are alluding to is really a systematic change in the thought process. And I think, Sherry, the way you said it, uh, the way we do that normally on the medical side, uh, it, we, we make a referral for uh, they need their gallbladder out, or we make a referral for some other process that we know they need. Uh, but we don't do that in behavioral health because we've never really talked about that. So if you were building a technology to, to fit specifically in, in, let's say, primary care, what all would you include in that? What, what, what would have to be in that technology to make it drive toward that vision of the healthcare system? Well, first, before Hans and I answer that, we're gonna to have to sign a non-confidential agreement because whatever we come up with, we're gonna we're gonna use it and 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 no. Um, just a, just a step back, that system already exists. I'm not saying it's the best healthcare system. I think we've all heard lots of complaints and lawsuits against the VA, 
But I believe the VA, the Veterans Affairs System, the Veterans Affairs Healthcare System, I think, Hansa, correct me, I think it's the largest healthcare system in the world, the way it's structured. And so they have that integrated model. Now, obviously, it's built within a government uh, structure, but from medical primary care to referring to other, you know, elective and mental health services, they have a, a national, um, and I'd probably say U.S. Armed, For Armed Forces are probably the other um, DOD divisions as well. They have a system in place where you get a medical screen and then you're triaged to whatever level of surgery or mental health. That concept exists. Um, so the technology we're talking about, Tom, is unfortunately, which is going to scare people, a master repository, a master list of referral options that people have to keep up with once you've adequately screened and come up with referral options. And the second you start talking about that, Hansa, if I was a medical provider, I'd be terrified of knowing whether or not that referral list is even up to date and regulated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's definitely uh, some hurdles to to you know think about, but I do think that you know there is because there's a system that exists that could be um, something that we could look at, just like. Uh, Sherry alluded to protocols in hospitals where you know we do evidence-based protocols, uh, which also should help standardize care in, in the mental health arena. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look at those models and, and you know use those as building blocks. Sure. I mean, the only thing that I would say is you know, I go back to the little grass, literally the grassroots is that this has to be a priority. Um, you know, it can't be, I'm not going to deal with mental health in my primary care setting because there's no reimbursement. I'm not going to deal with, with mental health because it's a distraction. It has to be a priority. There has to be some mandate that, you know, starting, of course, I'm speaking from pediatrics again, that, you know, that all of our kids are taken care of because they are the future. They're going to grow up. They're going to be adults. The issues aren't going away. But right now, you know, you can go into a healthcare provider and often you'll hear no reimbursement, don't have the personnel, can't hire the people because there's no reimbursement. So, you know, I think that we have to look at a more holistic approach to how we, uh, you know, how we go after this problem. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, probably going to have to get the federal government involved at some point, but that's a whole other panel. So I'll shut up now. Absolutely. Well, I want to focus the last few minutes on, on sort of one basic question. Uh, if we hope to contain this pandemic fire, and when I use the word fire and growth, I, I'm using it out of the terms I live out west. And, and, and when we say fire, we, we know what it means. It's an ever growing, ever encompassing. Uh, not only does it burn the area but it delivers the smoke for miles. Same thing with this pandemic. Uh, it's not just the immediacy of the, of, of the child, but it's everything that you, you folks have talked about. So if we're going to do that, if we're gonna contain this mental health fire, what, what has to happen? And what has to happen now uh, in, in the short run and any comments about the long run? So I'll, I'll just throw that open. What do we do now? What's the thing we need to do today? You put Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka in the White House. You put, I'm not joking, you put women of color, women who've spoken out about mental health, women who are marginalized, um, who are told you know, that mental health is a weakness, especially for these top tier athletes. You, you pick those two women who in the last six months have been vilified for putting their mental health needs first, put them as leaders, helping us all make decisions to prioritize mental health as an equal access need for everybody. I know that's such a simplistic concept, but it starts there. You have two women who have put themselves out there um, in a very vulnerable way um, as a mental health provider and as a father of a daughter who struggles with anxiety, and I'm very public about that. Those are role models for her, in my opinion, not because they're athletes, because they said, despite my physical body being a specimen of superiority, I need to take a break. And whether it's those women or, or individuals like that who speak out and who are heard and who have a platform and who are cool and relevant to our younger populations, who will eventually be our doctors, guys, and caring for us one day, I want to see those people out there helping us get mental health parity. 
as Sherry alluded to that, that paying reimbursement shouldn't be making decisions. I know these are idealistic concepts, but Tom, I wanna to see people in the White House, I wanna see people at federal levels who we all look up to and admire, helping us make decisions and helping us speak about how mental health is a very normal thing. And if you attend to it in advance, which we call prevention, you don't have to be in crisis. We understand that in the medical world, but in the mental health world, you're supposed to white knuckle it until you burn out. And that's just not acceptable anymore. Concept, what, how do we contain the fire? I think we need, to, we need to increase awareness. And I do agree with Josh's thoughts on how to do that. We live in a celebrity culture. Uh, and athletes absolutely are celebrities. So, you know, they can and should be spokespeople and they have been, and I've been really glad to see that. I think we also talk about our own stories, like Josh alluded to his own daughter, uh, you know, uh, uh, my book that's slated for publication in February, actually the very first story in the introduction is about my own daughter. So I think that as health practitioners, it's important to be really candid about how this affects everyone. So the celebrities, the health professionals being candid about this, raising awareness, and then also having educational modules, and this is one of them, about the fact that there are solutions and digital solutions can come in to help us bridge those gaps, but there's also other solutions. Uh, the program that I completed at Emory University, which is cognitive-based compassion training, uh, as a teacher, those are some mental health prevention tools. So building that out there. So I, I think it's just taking a loudspeaker and getting you know everyone all hands on deck and and just going after it because it is that important. Sure. Three words: remove the stigma. That's it. Let let's let's have a, an open platform, open discussions. My daughter, my son. You know, we all have these share these stories to share, and and I will tell you, Hansa, what I have found is that as I share my personal stories, other people share their personal stories. So remove the stigma of sharing the stories, and I think that what we'll realize is that we have a lot more in common than we think. Absolutely, sure. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, and uh, I, as as having a story about my own son to tell. Uh, I understand that, and I think we have to do that. Uh, I think substantively telling the stories of uh, not just athletes, uh, but every one of us. Uh, I, just as you said that, I thought uh, not too long ago, uh, Daryl Strawberry, I don't know if you're a baseball player or fans, but I'm a baseball guy, uh, came to Boise State to talk to the athletes about his struggles. And I saw in the paper today, Dabo Sweeney had him come to uh, Clemson to talk to, to the athletes just recently. And I think it's that kind of openness uh, at whatever level uh, that, that does start to change the discussion, uh, force a different way of, of functioning. So I think, I think those are, I agree with you, those are some of the, some of the things that uh, we can do to control the fire. Uh, and, and hopefully put it out someday uh, while we will never perfectly do it. Uh, I think that particular format uh, of openness. So I think in, in asking sort of one final thought from each of you um, about what we've talked about today to kind of summarize your thoughts and your feelings, We've got a few minutes left, and if we take take about three or four minutes each, uh, maybe anything we've left out, any thoughts you have that we haven't covered, uh, I think our audience would like to hear just based upon your own experiences. So, uh, Josh, you want to start? I'll put you on the spot first. Well, just to start, the four of us have never been on a panel together. Um, some of us have met each other before, but we've never worked together. And in the last three minutes, all four of us have acknowledged that we have at least one person in our family, our biological love line that struggles with something that is not only not shocking, it's beautiful because that's exactly what Sherry was alluding to. So the admission that we all have struggles, we may not all have a diagnosis, but we all have struggles and we all love people's struggles is such a compassion focused 
just way to discuss this. So I start there. Um, I'm grateful, Tom, for individuals like you. I've, I've known Tom for almost 15 years, and he is someone who spearheads initiatives and helps people get access to care and is very innovative. And I, I appreciate you bringing this panel together. Um, it's been a pleasure already, Sherry and, and Hansa, meeting you and hope I get to speak with you guys both. And Hansa, congratulations on your book. I didn't know it was coming out. That's fantastic. Um, I would just close with if anyone is struggling with concerns about their own safety, one of the most recognized resources out there is the National Suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255. It's the silent disease. It's a prevent preventable death. And for anyone who thinks that someone who kills themselves is weak, shame on you. That's someone who lost the battle to depression, just like someone loses the battle to cancer or diabetes. So 1-800-273-TALK for the National Suicide Hotline. Um, and the national helpline for, I think, substance abuse is 1-800-662-HELP. There are national lines out there. I have no affiliation with them. I know of them. I've had people use them. There are people out there for any one of you, your local community, your state organization, medical providers, synagogues, churches, speak to someone, and as Sherry said, end the stigma. Thanks, Josh. Hansa, your, your thoughts. I think that, uh, you know, we need to, I would say two words, you know, awareness and openness. So we need to increase awareness. We need to be open to all types of solutions because it is a fire storm. And I think also we just need to realize that there is a lot of work to do, but we can do it. We can do it. And, and I would say, you know, uh, what jo Josh said is absolutely, I would reflect that. My dog, my dog wants to have part of this conversation. Bring so the sorry. dog in. But dogs help with anxiety. So yes. there you go. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, you know, I just want to say I'm very grateful to be part of this, this panel as well. And just some, you know, I think we're all in, on the same thread of, thread of thinking and, and, you know, I think we all, if we could all unite and just do the work and move forward, I think, you know, we have hope. We have hope. Sure. So Hansa, I will tell you that my, my dog is, is actually on Prozac. So I, he, he is, he, he's, he's a rescue and he, you know, he's another family member that, that, that uh, needs a little bit of help every now and then. So um, I would just say, you know, ask people if they're okay. It's okay to reach out and just ask. Um, particularly someone who, you know, is, is, you know, leading an organization with over 60 individuals. I am, I want, I, I want my team members. Um, I want my friends to know that, that, uh, you know, that yes, that we're all here for them. Right. But it's okay to ask and it's okay for them to come in and talk. Um, you know, Josh and Hansa, I can't thank you guys enough for doing what you do. Josh, especially, I know this is, has to be a very difficult time for you. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Tom, thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, you know, I, I think this panel was absolutely wonderful and I couldn't have said my ending statements any better than, than, than Josh and, and, and Hansa. Um, so thank you all. Well, I want to I want to thank you all, and I want to thank our our audience uh, for for joining us in, in this discussion. A little bit uh, different than some of the other things that might be out there, but talking specifically and a bit more pointed, uh, I think about uh, some of the issues around our children, uh, some of the issues around all of us in terms of the pandemic, uh, the the causes of where we are now, and we're going to keep seeing it. It's it's not going to change, but I but I think there is there is a lot to be hopeful for. Uh, I think keying on what what Josh said, I think people are starting to talk about it. I think providers are starting to to look at how can I do some of these things that maybe I haven't been able to or don't know how to do. Uh, as it relates to mental health. Uh, maybe there are some system changes uh, that are going on that can help uh, help us focus on that particular item. So I do appreciate all of your time. I appreciate all of the people that have listened to us. Uh, if you have questions, please, uh, if we haven't focused on any of your questions, 
please feel free to send them in uh, and Holly, Holly will collect those and, and we'll sort of disperse them and I'll, I'll work at getting getting some answers back from the group uh, to some of the other some of the other questions you might have. I know that this may not have may not have been the, the complete discussion because I don't think there is a complete discussion. I think it's a continuing ongoing discussion and hopefully uh, we can bring you some other other looks at some other issues over time uh, as it relates not only to the pandemic but as it relates to the, the improvement in health and growth of uh, behavioral health. Uh, in mental health care in this country today. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Rob uh, for uh, final work. Thank you, Dr. Young. <clears throat> Excuse me, we are nearing the conclusion of our program. Uh, if you submitted a question that was not addressed during the panel discussion, it will be provided to our panelists along with your contact information for follow-up. Uh, you can also submit any follow-up questions as Dr. Young noted, um, to uh, the email address that's on your screen right now, hwilson at nview.com. Again, hwilson at nview.com. And uh, those questions will be passed along to our panelists. I personally want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to answer your great questions, Dr. Young for moderating the program. I also want to thank NVU for sponsoring the discussion and all of you for taking the time to join us today. This concludes our panel program. Thanks again for your participation. Have a great rest of your day and a wonderful summer.